So, I would like to tell you a story today, which was written by a lady about 850 years ago. We don't know very much about her, but we do know that she was called Marie, and that she wrote in an old version of French that she lived in England, possibly around the West Midlands. Why should she write in French, you may ask? Well, England in that time was a country of many languages, a country to which many people had come, and in which their languages had been adapted. Welsh, Irish, Scottish, French, Cornish, English, and Hebrew were all spoken alongside Latin, the language of the church and of the schools and universities, and all the languages of traders and merchants as well, German, Italian, Norse, and so forth. Anyway, Marie was a great storyteller. She particularly liked stories from Brittany, the northwestern tip of France with its own language, Breton, which is quite a lot like Welsh, and its own history, its own ways of doing things and of remembering them. The stories that Marie worked with are called lace, short, intriguing tales which make a powerful point about society or people and how they should behave. A lot of them involve animals, and a lot of them involve transformations, metamorphoses, as we might say, from animal to human and back again. The story we'll tell today concerns what we would call a werewolf, a human being who turns into a wolf at a particular time. What we call a werewolf, Marie calls bisclavre, or, as she says, as they call them in Normandy, a garwolf. Garwolves are very fierce. They eat people and get up to no good, and they live deep in the forests where they roam around, and it isn't advisable to seek them out. Knowing this, though, we can now follow, with Marie, the story of Esclavé. Part 1. There was once a man who lived in Brittany. He was a good man, who was well-liked and well-respected by his neighbours and by the king. He was married to an equally able and accomplished woman. They were very much in love and lived happily together. Not quite ever after, for something was not quite right. Every week the good man would disappear from his home for three days. Eventually, the lady decided to ask the man what he did during these three days. He was nervous and not keen to answer her. Please, he said, do not ask me. Great harm will come if I do, and if I tell you, that might come between us as well. Well, the lady didn't want to take no for an answer, and eventually persuaded the man to tell her. During those three days, he turned into Bisclavre, into a wild beast, and ran off into the forest so that he might not harm others. This was obviously shocking news for the lady to hear. She had a puzzling question for him, though. What happened to his clothes when he turned from man to beast? Ah, he replied, that is important, because if I were to lose my clothes and be unable to put them back on, I would not be able to turn back into my human form. The lady was even more curious about this, asking where he put the clothes, and eventually he told her that he placed them under a bush near to an old chapel, not far from the wood that could be seen from their castle. Well, what would anyone do on learning something like this? The lady was terrified by what she heard and decided to escape. She sent a message to one of the neighbouring families asking them to come to visit, and when they did, she told them the whole story. They thought together and decided that, for their safety, it would be better if they were to gather up Bisclavé's clothes while he was in beastly form so that he could not return. This they did, riding up to the wood that could be seen from the castle, finding the old chapel, and identifying the bush nearby where the clothes were hidden. Poor Bisclavé. His wife and friends had rejected him and betrayed him, but they had good reason, did they not? Who had done most wrong? As the days went on, people began to think that the good man was never going to return, and sooner than you might care to imagine, they forgot about him. And so did everyone. Part 2. A whole year passed. 
the king had decided to journey through the forest on his way to another part of the kingdom, and, as he and his companions entered a darker and thicker part of the forest, they startled Biscarve from sleep. Biscarve ran away from them, but they chased him. They chased him all day, for he was strong and quite capable of running very long distances, but eventually he tired and was captured. He was brought before the king and surprised everyone by behaving as a person would do, bowing to the king and trying, it seemed to many, to talk to him. The king certainly thought that this was peculiar, but felt pity for the animal. Bisclavre stayed very close to the king, hardly leaving his side. In fact, he followed him all the way back to the king's castle. Here the king made a home for him and took care of him, forbidding anyone from harming him. The wild beast was gentle with everyone, and soon became a great favourite at the court. Remember, in all of this, that no one knew who Biscarve really was. Well, that's not strictly true. A few people did. And it came about that, one day not long after, the friends of the good man's wife came to the castle to see the king. Biscarve saw them, and, without warning, in the middle of the palace, leapt at them, snarling and scratching. Things were looking very serious indeed, when the king, who had entered the room, called Biscarve off. Everyone was puzzled. Why would the beast attack, who had been so consistently well behaved? They decided, this time, that perhaps the beast had good reason. Perhaps something had happened between the beast and this family in the past. Those whom Biscleveray attacked thought differently. They did not like him at all. Part 3 More time passed, although not so very much, if Marie is not mistaken. The king went riding into the forest again. Biscleveray came with him. In fact, they passed very close by to the place where the king had first encountered him. Night fell. The king and his party decided to stay at a local lodging. The wife and friends of the good man, now Biscarve, decided to visit the king and to present him with gifts. They approached the house where the king was staying. Biscarve saw them and attacked them, again without warning and again in a ferocious manner. This time, the king's company were worried that Biscarve might be too dangerous and unpredictable and threatened to take him away. They were stopped, however, by a wise person amongst them who reminded them that Biscarve was, for the most part, a sweet and loyal beast, not ferocious at all. Perhaps it would be better, the wise one suggested, to work out why he attacked the people that he did, rather than leaping to conclusions. Let us start, the wise one went on, by remembering that the people he attacked are the wife and neighbours of the good man, respected by all who disappeared without trace over a year ago. Let's ask them why the beast seems to hate them. And this is exactly what happened. In the presence of the king and all his companions, the truth about Biscrove's identity was revealed. The whole story emerged. How they knew to take the clothes the good man had left behind, hidden, and how they knew that this would mean that he would not be able to turn back into human form. Did they believe that the beast was Biscrove? Yes, of that they were certain. The king asked for the clothes that the good man had hidden so carefully, and which had been denied to him, to be brought to Biscarve. The beast, however, showed no interest in the clothes, which made everyone wonder if what they heard had been true. Then the wise one spoke again. It is possible that the beast might want to change in private. Why would we think it would be easy or unembarrassing in public? So they took the beast and the clothes to a bedroom and left them there. Later, they returned to find the good man fast asleep on the bed. The king was overjoyed to see him, and so were all of his friends. All that is, except his wife and neighbours, who, sadly, could not accept Biscarve's nature, and they left the kingdom altogether at the king's command. Here Marie ends her tale. We don't know what happened to Biscarve or his friends, but we can imagine that they lived well enough together, and did not try to change Biscarve from his changeable nature. Whether the whole story is true, we will never know. But Marie assures us that it was, and that the story was told by the people 
to remember Biscrovet forever after. <laughs>